Well then, shall we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that other people, both Jews and Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even me. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Obviously, the law applies to those whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us that we are sinful, that we are. We read this passage this morning about God's law and the purpose of God's law. The first human beings were given just one law, one rule. And what was the purpose? What is the purpose of God's commandments throughout the Bible? <coughs> purpose, in the first case, the one rule God gave to Adam and Eve, the freedom to eat from every tree in the garden. It's all yours, it's all open for you to enjoy. But the one rule was, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from this tree, you will die. What's the purpose of this rule, the purpose of this law God gave them? Well, this is uh, a warning. It's a direction. So that life can flourish, it's given for their own good. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents more than just a piece of fruit but the desire to be like God. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they saw that it was beautiful, they saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom, and they thought, if we eat this, we will be like God, knowing all things. So God gave them this command in order for life to be good. Part of God's good command. So, like the way you give a rule to your children, don't run out into the busy street. It's a rule that should always be obeyed. Why? Because you love your children. So God gives them the freedom to eat from every tree, but says this is the one thing that you should not do, because if you do, it will lead to death. So, likewise with other commandments, this is in the, in the very beginning, uh, through with Abraham, God gave requirements related to circumcision. Through Moses, God spoke the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder, do not commit adultery, don't serve any other gods. Ten things. These are given as an expression of God's goodness. They're designed for our lives to flourish and for our society to flourish. If these were put into practice, would life be better? Of course it would. So the first thing, the purpose of God's law, is that it is created to create a world where human beings flourish. This is the reason God gives law. We've been going through Romans for uh, several weeks, and I've pointed out along the way, as we've talked a lot uh, about God's judgment, about sin, about God's law today. I've pointed out that uh, it is good for us to be able to make moral judgments, to say, this is evil, this is wrong, because there are things that happen in the world that are, that are evil, and we need to be able to say that. But along with that, then, goes the possibility of judgment, 
If we say there are things that are wrong and evil in the world, then there becomes the, comes the possibility that we would have things pointed out in us that are also evil, that are also sinful. In the passage that James read for us this morning, he said that another purpose of God's law is to show how sinful humanity is. So what does that mean? Uh, first, it would be helpful to know what sin is. We have a first thing, this is what most people think of as sin is breaking a rule. It's crossing a line. There's something that you know you should not do, but you do it anyways. I know a woman who got caught stealing money from the bank where she worked. Thousands and thousands of dollars. Did she cross a line? Did she break a rule? The whole world would say, yes, she did. There are sins related to money, there are sins related to sex, related to power, related to telling the truth. At our men's breakfast yesterday, we had a very interesting discussion about money, sex, and power. Not all the details, not a list of every sin that could be committed related to those, but we know that there are those things. There are times when we cross over the line. It can also be not just doing something, but not doing something. If you are given the power and you can prevent something bad from happening because you are too weak or too, too afraid about people liking you or approving you and you do not use the power that's been given to you, and likewise, you're not doing the right thing. The second thing about sin, it's not just breaking a rule, it is breaking a relationship. I know a couple in California that started a business, uh, a towing business, so they had a fleet of tow trucks, employees, and they trusted one man to be the manager, and they, he had the keys to everything, he had the uh, you know, uh, passwords to their computer, and, access to the accounts, they put a lot of trust in him. And he took that trust and stole their vehicles, stole their money, stole the accounts. And they ended up not just losing their vehicles, but losing the business and ending up with a debt that they had to pay. They had to file for bankruptcy. Did he cross a line? Did he break a rule when he did that? Yes. But even worse was that he broke the relationship. He broke the trust. Even worse than that they had to pay money back was the feeling of betrayal. And when the Bible talks about sin, it's not just crossing some line that happens to be there, but there is a person who is affected. We know this from our own experience. When somebody does something against us, it's not just, hey, you did something wrong, but that hurt me. And the relationship that is broken as a result. So that's another definition of sin. And there's a third one where we begin uh, to, and this is part of a motivation for sin, but also one part of the definition, that when we begin to worship or serve or love something other than God, which the Bible calls idolatry. An idol is a false god, something that we becomes the center of our life, which you're willing to sacrifice for. Usually, well, always, these are good things. In themselves, they are good, but they're made into the ultimate thing. In the past, people worshipped things like the sun, they worshipped rivers, they worshipped crocodiles, and said, this is a god. Today, not as often, but what do people worship now? What truly is the center of their life, the thing that they live for? Things like money, sex, power. Again, the things we talked about yesterday in our, our men's group. And sometimes people use religion. People even try to use Christianity as a way to get those things. And they say, if Jesus is a way for me to get more money, or sex, or power, then I'll do that. 
But what they are actually serving is not God, is not Jesus. It's the thing that they're trying to get. So James and John, two of the disciples of Jesus who spent a long time with him, they came to him and said, Jesus, when you're in your kingdom, we know you will be number one. You're the king. But what we have is a request. You can be number one, but I would like to be number two. Can I sit at your right hand? And can I sit at your left hand? They're seeking power and just barely acknowledging, well, Jesus is the king, but I would like to be a close second. And there are still people trying to do the same thing. But what God are they actually serving? It's the God of power. And it's worshiping an idol. And this is another part of <coughs> sin. So in our own human relationships, this would be like if your son said to you, well, Dad, I don't really care about you. I just want your money. <laughs> I don't really care about you, God. I just want what you can give me. So you see again how this is crossing over a line, it's also breaking the relationship, but it's turning something that is a good gift of God and making that more important than God himself. So the passage in Romans that we read, it says that uh, God's law reveals sin, and there are some different ways that this works. First is that we feel it first in our own conscience. You feel it when you have done something wrong. You feel a sense of guilt or a sense of shame. I, uh, I heard a story about a young uh, a kid who was only 10, 12 years old, and he would, um, he had a problem with how much he ate. And he had difficulty controlling it. And he would said that he would go into the cupboard and get a container of frosting, the stuff they put on cakes. It's all sugar plus fat, right? That's it. And he said he would sit in the kitchen and just spoon the whole thing into his mouth, just eat the whole container of frosting. And then immediately he felt, he just burned with shame. He would sit in the closet and just cry. He felt so ashamed. I think we all know at least a bit of that feeling. There are things that we do that we don't need anybody else to tell us, you shouldn't do that. You already know. Your conscience is already telling you it's not the kind of thing to do. The second way that that God's law reveals sin, and this, the way this reveals sin is because it, God's law is already written on our hearts. Earlier in chapter 2, Paul says, there are people who do not have God's written law. The Jewish people had God's written law, but other people, called, called the Gentiles in the Bible, non-Jewish people, it's written in their hearts, and sometimes they obey it, and sometimes they do not obey it. Sometimes their conscience says you're doing right, and sometimes their conscience says you're doing wrong. But the written law, which the Jewish people had, it reveals sin by showing how we fail to live up to God's standards. <coughs> showing that we fall short. And when it's spoken, when it's given, then it becomes clear there's a gap between what God is saying we should do and the way that we are living. So it shows where you cross over the line, what rules you break. Now, I know people say, but I've never murdered anybody. I've never cheated on my wife. I've never committed adultery. Uh, so I don't really see how this applies to me. Well, consider the two greatest commandments, which sum up all the rest. To love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. This is what God wants, our love. And the second thing God wants is similar. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then consider, have I achieved that. Or take Jesus and the way he took the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and he gave his interpretation. This is in the Sermon on the Mount, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said you should not commit murder. This is one of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus says, but I tell you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be judged. Anger being the root of murder. And maybe the only reason you never murdered anybody is because you didn't have a weapon handy. Maybe the only reason you never murdered anybody is because you were too much of a coward. 
but the desire is already inside. And Jesus is saying, God's law is intended to reveal these things in us. It shows the same sinful desire. Everybody, almost everybody you talk to will say, I respect Jesus as a good teacher. As a teacher, his morals, what he taught about life is, is good. Love your neighbor and so on. Love your enemies also. Those things are good. But you cannot avoid, if you say Jesus is a good teacher, then the things that he teach will end up making you very uncomfortable. Like when he talks about anger. Like when Jesus talks about not just adultery, but lust. He says that's the root of it. And in that case, we have to say guilty, guilty, guilty. All of us have fallen short of what God wants. The law of God even shows, not just that we've crossed over the line, but it shows that we don't even have the desire to follow things the right way. In chapter 7, the same uh, the author, Paul, he says, When I heard the commandment of God, do not covet, which means don't want something that belongs to other people. When I heard the command, all of a sudden, I found that I did want what belongs to other people. Kind of like when you're driving down the road here in Belgium and you see that smiley face that says, Ooh, rate 53. You're driving 53. And then it says, A sad face. Eh? You're going, it changes and it's a flashing sad face because you're driving too fast. And you think, I'll show you an unhappy face. Step on the gas a little more. Sometimes your desire is to do the wrong thing. And God's law reveals that. Okay, not everybody accepts God, that there is a God, or accepts God's law as it's revealed to us in the Bible. Well, then I would just ask, what are your own moral standards? <coughs> what do you think is the right way to live? What do you think is good and what is not good? Do people live up to even their own standards that they've set and expect other people to live up to? I remember a conversation with a, a man quite a while ago, and he was complaining about none of his, how none of his friends treated him the way that a friend should, should, uh, should, should act. You know, they weren't, very, they weren't patient enough, they didn't show enough attention, they didn't call him enough, whatever he was saying. And after a while I asked, do you, do you treat them the way that you're talking about, the way that you expect friends to treat, to treat you? Are you that kind of friend? And he's got quiet and he says, well, no, actually. We don't even live up to our own standards, much less God's standards. So the scripture last week, it said, we cannot condemn other people without condemning ourselves. And this is where we end up, saying that the law of God is good. It reveals what life should be like. The law of God is good, but it shows that we are not good, that we are sinful. We break rules, we break relationships, we worship things other than God as if they were God. This is sin. It's a quote from, uh, it's actually from a, from a movie producer from several decades ago, but he said, you cannot break God's law. You can only break yourself upon it. God's law is solid. And you think, oh, I can do whatever I want, I can break it. But it has inevitable consequences. Like somebody saying, I feel like breaking the law today. What do you mean, you're going to go speed? You're going to drive too fast? No, I'm going to break the law of gravity. I'm going to jump off a building and break the law of gravity. It does not work. It breaks you. And the more effort you might put into Fulfilling God's law, the more you realize you fall short. This is not saying that you should not do good. You should do good. But you should not think that you have the ability to make yourself acceptable, to, make your, to be good enough. Now, when this happens, when we, somebody begins to realize, when God's law begins to reveal sinfulness, there are two responses that are possible, more really, but you can either fight or flight. 
You can fight against it or you can run away from it. Some of the ways, uh, well, I would say, some of you are saying, it is, it's refreshing to be told the truth, right? It's kind of refreshing sometimes for somebody to say, what you're doing is completely wrong and you need to change. It can wake you up and you realize, yes, you're right, I need to change. On the other hand, when you confront somebody or you are confronted, sometimes the response is, no, you're the one who's always in it. And you begin to fight and lash out, right? Or you can also then try to run away. Some of the things that I hear people say, especially, I mean, in the United States, I don't know if people say the same thing here, but if you begin to talk about good and evil and sin and these things, people say, we're all human. We're all human. By which they mean, hey, it's not a big deal. Everybody does this. Everybody falls short. Not a big deal. Or it would say, nobody's perfect. As a way of excusing, a way of avoiding uh, focusing on this, which is correct, right? We are all human, and we are not perfect. Uh, they mean to say, it's no big deal. But here it says, oh, this is a big deal. Isn't it, for us personally, if somebody crosses the line and does something against us? If somebody breaks a relationship with us, is it not a big deal? And our sin against God, is it not also? serious thing. Sometimes people run, they don't fight, but they kind of take flight and they run to religion. Say, I'm religious now, I'm a good person, I, I'm part of a church, I do these things, or I've joined this, I'm, I'm doing good now. Still not realizing this is not the correct solution. Some people say the problem in the world is a lack of education, other people say it's a a lack of, uh, lack of effort, simply need to do more. Neither of those, really, is it. What is the solution, then? Well, the problem is not found just out there, but it's found inside us. God's law reveals this is where the problem is. So the solution from the problem has to get inside us. Not come from more effort, because that's where the problem is. It's from inside us. Now, okay, all these depressing sermons about sin and judgment that we've had in Romans chapters 1 through 3. Could we get some good news? I can't tell you. Just wait till next week. That's when we get into the good stuff, and you're going to want to shout for joy. That's true. You're going to want to shout for joy next week, but I've got to give you at least a hint and say, where does this lead to? This is the diagnosis. What is the cure? Again, it's good to tell, hear the truth. An accurate diagnosis is an important thing. Uh, a man that uh, grew up in the same neighborhood as me, he had pain in his stomach, went to the doctor, the doctor said there's nothing wrong, and that night his spleen ruptured and he died because the diagnosis was not correct. It is so important that we know the truth about ourselves and about the world and about God. And this is an important piece of it to recognize we are sinful people. Then you can hear the cure, which is the very next verse in Romans, right after where James stopped reading. Chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. No one, this is the, the answer when people say, but I'm religious. The answer when people say, we're all human, nobody's perfect. There are no excuses. The entire world is guilty before God. But then the next verse in Romans uh, 3, 20 and 21, next one. Yeah, misdiagnosing the problem, a lack of education or a lack of effort. The accurate diagnosis that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin and then the cure. One more. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. 
no matter who we are. Ah, is salvation, the, the way of being made right with God, that has not, is not coming from the law, is not coming from our own efforts, it's not coming from our goodness, it's not coming from religion, it comes through Jesus Christ. There's a man uh, I, I know who grew up as a, a Buddhist, and he said, as a Buddhist, he was well aware of his sins. And so he was constantly making offerings and sacrifices to whoever he could, at whatever altar he could. And when somebody shared to him this message of Jesus Christ and they spoke about sin, he nodded his head because he already knew, yes, there is a problem. And when this person went on to talk about forgiveness through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by putting faith in him, immediately said, that's the solution that I have never had. That God himself has become a human being, paid the price of sin, died on a cross for me, and rose from the dead. I will put my, my trust in him. I will give my life to Jesus. That is the cure. That is the solution. Give your heart, give your life to Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we've heard some hard words over the past weeks, uh, but true words, revealing this, our own, the state of our own hearts and the state of our world. We turn from you. We break rules. We break relationships. We have put other things in the center of our lives when it should be only you. Now we repent. We turn from our sin and we turn to you. If we are seeking something else besides you and trying to get you to fulfill those desires we have, we confess that to you now. And we acknowledge there is uh, not enough goodness in us, in us to earn your approval. All we can do is turn to you, Lord Jesus, put our faith in you. And God, I haven't said enough this morning about the good news. I pray that you would speak that to people, that you'd give people assurance of forgiveness, the assurance of your love, but when we turn to Jesus, we are washed 100% clean and given new freedom, given a new life. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.